It's now my joy to invite up Rabbi Ken Ehrlich to speak some words of Torah. Hi, good There's so many microphones, I'm not sure which one to use. <laughs> Steve, can everybody, can everybody hear me? Yes? Good. That's the second most important question that the Darshan should ask. The, the first is, has everybody remembered to turn off the cell phone? <laughs> like many of you, uh, I'm a football fan. But I'm a special kind of football fan. You see, I'm an avid avid fan of a team that no longer exists, the Baltimore Colts. I learned to love the Baltimore Colts when I was a college student in Baltimore in the 60s. How could I not love the Colts? With players like Norm Parker and Bubba Smith and John Mackey and Gino Marchetti and Raymond Berry and Lenny Moore and Johnny Unitas. God, Johnny Unitas. They were one of the greatest professional football teams ever. I celebrated every Colts victory. I suffered through their defeats. I loved them still when they lost Super Bowl III to the hated New York Jets. And we all know, don't we, all of us, we all know that the Colts would have won that game had Unitas not been injured that year. And I mourned, along with the entire city of Baltimore and Colts fans everywhere, when Robert Irsay, the owner of the Colts, moved the team from Baltimore to Indianapolis. In the middle of the night, he just packed up the entire team, put them on Mayflower Van Line, and moved them and sneaked out of town. He said it was just a business decision. But we didn't care. We swore we will never forgive him. Shortly after the move, a colleague of mine, the rabbi of a synagogue in Baltimore, said, and he said this, I'm sure, only half jokingly, if Mr. Irsay showed up on Yom Kippur, asking God to forgive him for taking the Colts from us, the master of the universe would look down and have a one-word answer. Never. <laughs> now, our discussion this day is about granting forgiveness. It may seem that the story about the Baltimore Colts is not really the appropriate introduction to such a serious topic, but bear with me. In its way, the story is going to teach us a lesson that defines the meaning of this Day of Atonement. Our tradition says quite a bit about God granting us forgiveness. The Talmud explains that whether or not God grants us forgiveness depends largely on how we ask for it. Our request for forgiveness must comply with certain rules. For example, we must publicly acknowledge our offenses, confess, and publicly apologize for our sins, if you will. Our apologies must be unconditional, no strings attached. This is not a real apology. I'm sorry, but our apologies cannot be veiled, please, for pardon. A sincere apology recognizes and accepts that there's a price that we have to pay for bad actions. At the very least, we must feel remorse, even guilt. If our actions cause damage or loss to another person, we must make reparation or restitution to the one we have harmed. And the most important rule of all, our tradition tells us that we must prove to God, prove to God that we have changed. That is, we will never again repeat our offense. Now, while our tradition is replete 
with accounts of people asking God for forgiveness, there are surprisingly few instances in the Torah or the Talmud that describe one person asking another person for forgiveness. So too with our Yom Kippur prayers. In this entire big book, this machzor, there are many times when we ask God to forgiveness, for forgiveness, but really very few occasions when we ask forgiveness from each other. So with so few references in the Torah and the Talmud and the prayer book, how then should we respond if someone asks us for forgiveness? Do the same rules apply? The book of Jonah, which is the traditional reading for Yom Kippur, offers us guidance. Now, we're going to hear the complete story this afternoon when Tony reads the book as God intended the book to be read, because only Tony can read it that way. <laughs> so let's just cut to the ending. Jonah, one of two main characters in the book, is sitting alone under the sweltering sun, bemoaning the fact that God, who is the other main character in the book, has forgiven the Ninevites, the hated enemies of Israel after they sincerely repented for their sins. If God can forgive such evil people, Jonah reasons, then what in the world is the meaning of justice? In the next scene, God causes a broad-leafed plant. In Hebrew, a kikayon, presumably some sort of a gourd, to provide shade for Jonah. Just as Jonah finds some relief from the heat, God causes a worm, more likely a caterpillar, to eat the plant so that Jonah is once again under the scorching sun. See, says Jonah to God, that proves my point. You forgive the wicked people when they repent, but you leave your own prophet to suffer. Life's not fair. Just kill me now and be done with it. And now the final scene. God responds by asking Jonah a question. This is God's response to what Jonah says. He asks a question. Ha hetev karalacha al hakikayon, which is usually translated as, is it right that you are angry about the plant? And then the scene ends when God reminds Jonah that there are a lot of people in Nineveh and also a lot of cattle. And that's the ending of the book. Now one of the most confusing parts about this ending is that we never hear the answer that God asked to the question that God asked Jonah. So to find the answer, we are forced now to go beyond the ending of the book. We have to create a midrash. We have to use our imagination. So let's look again at the question. Is it right that you are angry about the plant? Our Midrash prefers a translation that more closely follows the idiom of the Hebrew grammar, hahetev charalacha. Is it good for you to hold on to your anger? Now what is the translation, that answer? What does it imply? This. God is saying this to Jonah. I am God. And because I am God, I have the power to look into the human heart, to judge all human beings, and to know if their apologies are truly sincere. I can look into the future and know for sure that they will not repeat their bad actions. And when I determine that their apologies are truly sincere, that they've really changed, then and only then, I might forgive them. I might absolve them of their sins. I might take away the consequences of their actions if I want to. But you, Jonah, you don't have those powers. You cannot judge people the way I do, and you shouldn't. I don't expect you to. It's not your responsibility to forgive the Ninevites. I never asked you to. That's up to me and me alone. 
And then our Midrash continues. But consider this. Is it really good for you to do what you're doing? Is it good for you to hold on to your anger? Does all your righteous indignation really help you in any way? Does it make you a better person? As far as I can see, you are just making yourself unhappy. In the book of Jonah, God asks his prophet a question. In our Midrash, God answers that question. Is it good for you to hold on to your anger? No, it isn't. Jonah, let it go. We all have grievances, don't we? We all feel that we've been wrong this past year. Most of the wrongs that people have done to us more or less fall into the category of mistakes of the head, not of the heart. Someone insulted us by saying the wrong thing, in the wrong way, at the wrong time, in the wrong place, to the wrong people. Someone ignored us when we wanted to be noticed. Someone dismissed us when we so wanted to be heard. Even when they're unintentional, such thoughtless actions hurt nevertheless. Nevertheless, they make us angry. But some of the wrongs done to us have been much more serious, causing lasting damage to friendships and to families and to entire communities. Lies and betrayals, abuses of power and authority, in whatever guise or whatever form, form are never, ever forgotten. And the hurt and the anger they cause never really go away. Sometimes people apologize for the wrongs they've done and the hurt they've caused. And when they do, how then should we respond? Can we, like God, truly, truly forgive? The book of Jonah tells us we can't. To err is human, the poet says, to forgive divine. Because we are only human, we can't know for sure which apologies are sincere and which aren't. Because we are only human, we can't take away the consequences of bad actions. Because we are only human, we live only in the present. We can't look into the future. We can't erase the past. The Torah, the Talmud, the prayers on Yom Kippur all agree. Only God can grant true forgiveness. But the book of Jonah teaches us that we still have a responsibility here to ourselves and to others. We, like the prophet Jonah, can learn to let it go, to move on, to not allow sadness or anger or resentment or grievances to consume us. When we let go, we give ourselves another chance to be happy. But there's more to it than that. When we let go, we say to those who have hurt us, whether the hurt they cause is deliberate or accidental, whether they apologize or not, we say to them, you have wronged me, and you'll have to live with that. But in spite of the hurt you've done to me, I'm willing to give you another chance. Letting go. Giving a person another chance is always a risk, always. But by letting go, we say that we are willing to take that risk. That the broken relationship is worth repairing. By letting go, we take a step forward towards another person, but without knowing exactly where that step will lead, which makes the step we take an act of faith, a kind of grace. That's not complete forgiveness, but it is a start. Oh, and what about us Baltimore Colts fans? 
After all these years, we're still angry, I have to admit. We're still angry at Robert Irsay for moving our beloved Colts out of Baltimore. But, as he said, business is business. After all these years, it's probably time for us Baltimore Colts fans to shift allegiance maybe to the San Francisco 49ers or the Seattle Seahawks, maybe even to the Baltimore Ravens. And I can't believe I'm saying this, maybe even to the Indianapolis Colts. I guess it's time for us to let it go. Gmar Tov, Gmar Khatima Tova, may we all be inscribed for health and happiness in the Book of Life.